Fiesca Samsau. I am part of our social justice committee, and I am thrilled to have these presenters here today that I'm going to announce. I would like to start with the CSU land acknowledgement. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land-grant institution, and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion, and significantly that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. I would like to introduce our presenters, Gabriella Zayn and Israel Derry. Um, they are both students in the social work department, Gabriella in the bachelor's department, and Israel in our master's program. Uh, I am especially delighted that they have brought the issue that they are presenting today on Middle Eastern and Muslim individuals and the discrimination that is faced by them into light for us to learn about. They have asked our department and our college and our school in general to rise up to the challenge of being more aware and holding these conversations to make sure that we are treating people with respect. Um, and I also want to give a shout out. Gabriella has really worked Hard with one of her classmates school people to try to create movement around a social justice type of course and we've had this effort going for three different years but because of the amount of meetings that she has attended the amount of contact she continues to make the university is finally taking this seriously and there is movement to try to create this as an option <laughs> started into this presentation, I'm going to prompt a couple questions on the screen and what I want everyone in the room to do, if you're comfortable, is shout out, I mean like not yell, but shout out, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you see these words, and I want you, we're all adults in this room, we can be mature about it, I want you all to be as honest and transparent as possible, nothing you say is going to hurt my feelings, so let's hear it. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of a Muslim? Hijab. Religion. Good. Okay. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the Middle East? Muslim. Okay. 
So everything you just kind of heard, like muttered in the in the room, I really want everyone to sit with those things and those words that you hear throughout this presentation, um, so that you kind of like can reflect on the impact that those words have and how people like view us, and um, we'll be talking about that throughout. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to do, since you know we're in a classroom and we're at CSU, is kind of like geography 101. Um, so who in here knows the difference between an Arab, a Middle Eastern, a Persian, and a Muslim? Are they? They're all the same, right? No. No. What? You mean what the media shows us is not accurate? <laughs> okay. So right here, if I can get this to work. Let's see. So Arab and Middle Eastern are contrary to popular belief, actually not synonymous. If you are an Arab, that means that you come from a country whose um, language of origin is Arabic, right? So you've got countries here in North Africa, um, you've got Egypt, you've got Libya, Morocco, Sudan, those are Arab countries. People from those countries are Arabs. People over here in this Gulf area right here are Middle Eastern. You don't have to be an Arab. Just because you're from the Middle East doesn't mean that you're an Arab. There's people from Iran. There's people from Kyrgyzstan. There's people from, um, did I say Iran already? <laughs> Afghanistan that are not Arabic speakers. So they do not get lumped under that umbrella. And all of these countries here that are especially the ones in the dark green are really in the media we see as lumped under this like one umbrella, like everyone is the same. When in reality, people from Egypt have very, very different cultures and traditions than people in Saudi Arabia. The other thing that I want to kind of like emphasize on is that a lot of people think that being an Arab and being Middle Eastern means that you have to be a Muslim, which is the religion, right? Which is not true. You have people in Egypt, there's Last time I checked, there were, I think was like a, it was only like 85 or 80 percent of the population was Muslim. You have also Muslims that are all around the world that are not from the Middle East. You have them in South America, you have them in North America, Europe, Russia, and all those different things. So I just kind of wanted to establish those grounds before we started. Okay, so the Muslim majority of Middle Eastern population, which is numbering in hundreds of millions, gives the perception that the Middle East is only However, like Israel said, a large number of non-Muslims are psychic. The Jewish population in Israel numbers 7 million out of the total population of 9 million. And a Christian Coptic community in Egypt numbers more than 10 million. The Christians in Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, and what's left of them in Iraq number more than 3 million. Now, Islam considered a Christian and Jewish population as people of the book, meaning that they share the same God and religious beliefs as Islam and members of both communities were allowed to continue practicing their religion and keep their property and institutions. Um, and this meant rabbis, synagogues, priests, and, and churches. And rabbis and priests became the representatives of their communities in dealing with the Islamic government. And this merging of the social and religious identities continued during the Ottoman Empire. And in today, in many Middle Eastern countries, the individual feels a stronger religious identity than a national. All right, so since I'm doing like the Geography 101, I'm gonna do the Islam 101 too. First of all, one thing that I wanna point out is we are people, people who practice the religion of Islam. We're very dehumanized. I have a family. I grew up, I had a childhood. I'm that cute little baby in the middle of America. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm the cutest boy. <laughs> I eat, I sleep, I breathe. I study, I have long nights, I have good days, I have bad days, just like everyone in this room. And unfortunately, because of the way that we're portrayed in the media, it's easy to kind of compartmentalize, I hate that word, us into this kind of other. And we're, when, when, there, when we're this other, it's easy to dissociate, and it's easy to not remember that we are people too, right? So, some basics about Islam. Difference between Islam and a Muslim. Islam is synonymous with Christianity. So Islam is a religion that is practiced. Muslim is synonymous with Christian. So it is the um, individual who follows the religion. On the other end, there's a few terms that I'm gonna be using throughout the presentation. 
are Islamic center, center or masjid or mosque. And those are all, um, masjid is the Arabic word for it, um, but those are all, um, they all mean like the place of worship for Muslims. Um, and it's kind of, it's you know, synonymous to a church, I guess. Um, Islam means literally submission to the will of God. And the word Islam is derived from the word salam in Arabic, which means peace, contrary to popular belief, right? If you think of Islam, a lot of people think of the opposite of peace, right? And so Islam is really a, a religion that's based on the foundations of peace and tolerance. When we greet each other, when Muslims see each other in public, we say assalamu alaikum. What does assalamu alaikum mean? It means peace be upon you or peace be with you. So when we see each other, we wish peace among each other. And then the last thing um, is a few terms that I'm going to be throwing around also is hijab. My cat over here, my cat, my cat was wearing a hijab. I guess he decided to uh, follow the religion of Islam or something like that. Um, but I'm going to refer be referring to the scarf that I'm wearing on my head as a hijab. Um, so just so that everyone kind of knows when I throw around those words. Okay, so for this slide, I'm going to be channeling my inner Julia Roberts from my favorite <laughs> baby, movie, Mona Lisa Smile, growing up as a child. This is how the Middle East Arab Muslims communities were portrayed in European paintings in the 19th century. In this first painting, it depicts men surrounding this belly dancer, and if you notice, they have lusty smiles and sleazy looks. The next painting, which is the Turkish bath, is an erotic and voyeuristic scene of nude women who are objectified and exoticized. And finally, the one of Edward Said, the Arab-American author who created the book Amer uh, Orientalism, which is one of the most influential and in intellectual history books of the 20th century, chose for the cover of his book. Of his book. Notice the beautiful wall in the background with the blue carvings and the tiles. Now, this is the old, rich Middle Eastern civilization. Let's contrast it now with these men surrounding this young naked boy who's holding a snake that is almost phallic-like. This implies that these are barbaric and other pedophiles. Edward Said suggested that this type of representation was meant to portray the Arab and Muslim other as a morally corrupt society, justifying the European colonization in the 19th and early 20th century. And this mental picture of the Middle East has a modern day parallel. After September 11th, the Bush administration went to war in the Middle East, and he justified this with the arguments he justified their invasions with the argument that they are liberating these Muslim women from these oppressive men and bringing democracy back to these failed states. And unfortunately, this negative image of the Arab and Muslim other continues to be how the Middle Eastern community is perceived today. So before we get into stories about like our own experiences and how it affects like our culture today, we think it's important to go over history and where it started and how it's impacted us to this day. So we can identify two waves of immigration historically. In the late 19th century, the first wave of immigrants benefited from an open immigration policy, meaning anyone can immigrate to the United States in the 19th century. And Christians from Lebanon were the first to immigrate. The first wave of immigrants did not establish a strong distinctive identity because of their low number, which was less than 100,000. They tried to integrate and not to stand out, a main reason being that they did not feel welcome. They had arrived at a time where white Protestant nativism was active and hostile to these people who were darker skinned, did not speak English, and followed the Catholic or Orthodox Church. In 1924, a new immigration act limited uh, immigration through a quota system that remained in place until the 60s. <laughs> and the second wave started in 1965, when the Immigration and Naturalization Act abolished the quota system. Now this had the effect of increasing the number of immigrants including those from the Middle East, especially Muslim immigrants. And they settled in the Northeast, Midwest, and California, forming their own ethnic neighborhoods. These immigrants came in larger numbers, were wealthier and more educated than those from the first wave, and they remained engaged in Middle Eastern politics, as their country of origin and relatives they left behind were dealing with political instability in which the U.S. was involved. Like the June 1967 Six State War between Israel and Arab countries, the 1973 Arab oil embargo, the 1979 Iranian Islamic Revolution, and the American hostage crisis, and finally 9-11, which led to an increasing negative attitude towards the Middle Eastern communities. 
But the history of mistrust and discrimination can be traced back to President Nixon's executive order of September 1972, in which he targeted Arabs, Arab community, communities specifically with restrictions on allowing them to enter and stay as permanent residents in the United States. And he justified this with the fear of Arab terrorism entering the United States. This led to an aggressive surveillance, and similar measures were implemented after 9 11. So, we're going to do another little activity here. And again, I'm going to show you some images now that we see in the media often on the news of Muslims, of Middle Easterns, of Arabs. And when you see these images, I want you to again yell out, but very loudly. What do you think when you see this? Honestly, Jihad. Jihad. Okay, next one. So, I mean, it's the only thing that you can find when you look at, look up Middle Eastern men, right? They got some nice beards though, right? <laughs> but then there's also the other end. Right? The money, the luxury, right? Can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, oh, you don't need to worry about student loans. You don't need to worry about this. You don't need to be worried, but, uh, worried about that. You're loaded, aren't you? Why don't you just buy dinner for all of us? Now let's look at the woman. We're oppressed, right? Silenced. We don't have voices. My dad forced me to wear this. He beat me so that I could wear this, right? I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, I want to help you. I want to free you of the oppression you're living. Sexualized Arab woman. Israel, have you been called a belly dancer before? Asked a belly dance? Absolutely, me too. We're fetishized. Fetishized. Fetish, yeah, however you say that. Right, and then reorienting the perception. We've got Gigi Hadid here, right, trying to assimilate basically its cultural appropriation. And she's got this veil as to say, you know, this is cool, right? Middle Eastern women are cool. They're accepted, completely defeating the purpose of the veil and hypersexualizing it. And then you've got Arab women like myself, <laughs> fighting the stereotypes, right? Women can hold guns too, right? All right, let's talk about 9-11. So I was a little bit too young to remember when this happened, but I do remember like the impact that it had on my family. It was three years after my family moved here from Egypt. And again, they were here after the American dream, right? They wanted better lives for their children. Let's look at the spike in hate crimes that occurred towards Muslims the year after 9-11, or the year of 9-11. Got less than 50 prior to that, and a little under 500, and these are just reported. And I can tell you in this last year, just among the Muslim, the Muslims and Arabs that I know, just the ones that I know, have experienced surpassed 500 hate crimes, whether it's verbal, physical, assaults, all of that stuff. But I do want to highlight something beautiful that happened here in our community when 9-11 occurred. So it was on a, a Tuesday, I believe. I don't want to misquote. But the Friday following that, uh, the Muslim community here in Fort Collins, we had a small little mosque that was a, a church previously, and it was purchased for the, for the Muslim community. And the Friday after, there is this uh, Jum'ah prayer, um, which is at usually around noon. So the whole community is going there to go pray, but people are scared, people are terrified. People don't know what's gonna happen to them. People don't know if someone's gonna pull a gun and shoot them, tell them to go back to their country. And this isn't the image of the event, but this was another, this was an image of another event that happened at our mosque at, at another time. Um, but essentially what happened was people from all around the community came together, held hands, brought roses and surrounded the whole entire vicinity of the mosque as to say we are here for you we're here to protect you you are safe you are welcome but it's not every day that we feel like that unfortunately something bad has to happen 
to some of us for people to notice, for people to remember that we exist and for people to remember that we're suffering. Back in, uh, after, uh, in February of 2015, one of my best friends, her three friends in Carolina were murdered execution style because two of them looked like me and one of them was married to someone who looked like me. And what did the media say about it? <coughs> they said, oh, he was upset because it was a parking dispute. So he wanted his payback. So he went to their homes, right in front of their homes and shot them execution style, months after their wedding. When a Muslim does it, right? He's a terrorist. When a black person does it, he's a gangster. When a white person does it, he's mentally ill. This terrorist right here, that's never gonna, that is never gonna leave me. Everywhere I go, every person I interact with, people see these images, right? Even if they don't believe them, they know they're out there. People call me these things. And I don't want to get political now. We're not going to get political whatsoever. I respect everyone and their, and their beliefs and their political stance. But the reality of it is, since the election of Trump, there has been an exponential increase in hate crimes against Muslims. And maybe to your surprise, on this very campus. There's been an average, all data sets show kind of different things, but there has been an average of about 60 to 75 percent increase in hate crimes towards Muslims, whether that's verbal assault, whether that's physical assault, and all those different things. So, well, let's go back to this. Two, three, maybe four weeks ago, I, I am really bad with time. I was walking on this campus, got off the bus, walking to my car in this very scarf that I'm wearing right now. And I was feeling very defeated that day. I was having a rough day. And a man took it upon himself, who was clearly a student on this campus, had a backpack on, to casually just walk by me, say, you look like a terrorist. Go back to ISIS. So I made a joke this morning, right? And I took a picture with my scarf and posted it on Snapchat. And I was like, back at it again with the ISIS scarf. But it's, you know, it's, it can be funny. We can make it into jokes. But in that event, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't speak up to him. Not because I was literally like physically restrained from doing that, but I just didn't have it in me. I was tired of fighting. Students were walking by. People could have heard it. No one did anything. So what did I do? I got in my car. I drove off. Back in 2015, so our Muslim community here at Fort Collins has been working extremely hard to build this mosque for the growing Muslim community here. And back in 2015, after the, um, it was kind of during the election period, someone took it upon themselves to express their hate. And they took rocks and they smashed rocks into the glass doors that led to the prayer room of the men at the masjid. Thankfully, no one was there and no one was injured, but this shattered our community. For weeks and for months, people were afraid to go to the place where they were supposed to feel safe, where they were supposed to feel welcome. And again, I want to highlight the reaction of the community, but again, the community doesn't come together and support us until something bad happens, right? So we had hundreds and hundreds of people gather together with candles from different religions, different cultural backgrounds, different ethnicities, different genders and ages, singing songs of harmony and bringing us together. And it was a beautiful moment, but the reality is we are still afraid. So people like myself, people like Gabriella have to speak up. I have to go out of my way to say, hey, I'm not a bad person. Hey, we actually probably have more common than you think. Hey, I come in peace. No, I'm not hiding a bomb under my scarf. And you would be surprised at how many people have actually asked me questions like that. But on the other end, people are feeling silenced. People are scared to speak up. People don't want to speak up because they feel like no one's going to do anything about it. I get harassed. I get verbally assaulted. I get physically assaulted. And no one is going to do anything because I'm a Muslim. I am the other. Right? It's
it's okay because, you know, we're the source of all the terrorism and the war in this world, so we probably deserve it anyways. A few months ago, this woman, this kid, 16 years old, Muda Skandinavia, she was uh, running in a race. And she won. She got her place. But then guess what? She was disqualified. Take a guess why. Because of her hijab. This 16-year-old girl couldn't even have the freedom to practice her religion freely and participate in activities and sports without being completely traumatized. 16 years old. Well, let's just sit with that. <laughs> okay, so the size, of, the size of the U.S. population has a Middle East, Arab, and Muslim origin varies according to different sources from 2.5 to 4 million. Now the reason for this wide range is that there is no separate categories in the U.S. census forms for people to identify themselves as the Middle East. And oftentimes, I know Israel and I have had to do this, um, we have to identify ourselves as white or as other. Or African American because, hey, I'm African and I'm American, right? There's mm -hmm. nowhere else I can put my myself. Exactly. So according to the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, not being counted on the census as a Middle Eastern means that we do not receive the same services, resources, and protections from discrimination that other minority communities do receive because they are counted. So if we're living in a society that is truly colorblind, this would not matter. The reality, however, is that Middle Eastern population is subjected to discrimination. And should we, should we be recognized as an ethnic minority? So as Mustafa Bayoumi says, Different enough to hate, not different enough to count. So, Arab and Muslim students on campuses, what do we know? We really do not know that much. According to the Council on American Islamic Relations 2017 Civil Rights Report that schools, colleges, and universities were the most common location where anti-Muslim bias incidences took place in California in 2016. In an older study, According to the Arab American Institute, 76% of young Arab American students ages 19 to 29 years have experienced discrimination and microaggressions. And some examples of this discrimination and microaggressions is how anti-Muslim hate groups are actively being recruited on college campuses. And that women are usually targeted and subjected in the sense that they are either forcibly or pulling, people are pulling or forcibly removing their headscarves. So I'm going to talk about myself for a little bit. Um, I never really identified myself as Middle Eastern. I felt American. The only connection I had to being Middle Eastern was that of my biological parents, because I'm adopted from the Middle East. And the law in Lebanon is you are never allowed to know anything about your parents, and they're never allowed to know anything about you. So that was the only connection. And in a way, I was protected from discrimination and microaggressions because I went to a lot of international schools growing up where ethnicity and where you come from was not the main conversation. We looked at each other as individuals because we all came from different places. So it wasn't like we were subjected into this square box. And it wasn't until I came to CSU that I felt that I was different. At CSU, I was targeted more in a physical way. Men would grab me and grope me and touch me on this campus and off campus, and they would comment on how I was more acceptable in Middle Eastern because I do not cover myself and I do not have a hijab. There's been almost every single Lyft and Uber drive that I have been in, I've been questioned and questioned and questioned by men about my ethnicity, and them cornering me basically in the back seat, telling me that they don't want to drop me off until I give them my number. I've been targeted in a sense that when I came on the school, I had someone come up to me and ask me if I had a bomb in my backpack. I've had people come up to me and touch my hair. So like I said, I feel like I've experienced it more in a physical way, but I didn't even understand what this stuff meant to me. I almost felt like I needed to feel ashamed of my identity, that I needed to say I'm American to avoid receiving this kind of discrimination and these types of microaggressions that were being thrown at me. 
And it wasn't until I took um, a class, Dismantle, this is my pen, Dismantle <laughs> Privilege and Oppression with Marie Zamso, that I was learning about these microaggressions and these oppressions that were taking place. And we were learning about all these different communities that we should actively be speaking up for, which I agree, we should be actively speaking up for minority communities. But somehow, the Middle Eastern community was never spoken about. So imagine someone like Israel, someone like me, someone like anyone who identifies himself as a, as a Middle Eastern on this campus, feeling that they aren't even worthy enough to talk about, that their pain means nothing. And so I went to Marie, and I told her how I felt. And I said, I feel lost in my own identity. I am now just discovering what this means to have an identity and to say I'm a Lebanese woman. That I don't even know how to identify people on this campus who might relate to me, because I can't even find them. And I don't even know if I'm able to find them. And he redirected me to uh, the Lori Spoon Center for APAC, Asian Pacific American Cultural Center, which is supposed to represent the Middle Eastern community. And so when I went, I felt the same way that many students who've gone into that center feel, which is this does not represent me. This is Asian Pacific American Cultural Center. This has nothing to do with the Middle East. But, and looking at this list, there's a lot of minorities that are represented. And yes, they need to be represented way more. I do not want to silence those minorities, but we're not represented at all. And so I wanted to have an interview. I didn't want to just stay silent. I wanted to have an interview with Joanne Carnell and um, Carl Murray, who are who have very nicely like come to this presentation, and they're sitting in the back. Um, <laughs> And I had an interview with them because I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand why is it that we are being pushed towards this community? And why is it that we are being pushed, pushed towards this community? Why we're not being represented in the community? And they said they've had a hard time being able to reach out to Middle Eastern communities because just like the US Census form, CSU does not give the option to mark yourself as Middle Eastern. So since I've been at CSU, I've had to mark myself as white or as other. And so it, it feels impossible. So they can't even find those communities. And they said that they are wanting and that they are willing and that they understand that even though their duty is to serve their community, their duty is also to serve the students of CSU, which we really appreciate the caring. And the way that they wanted to do that was by starting to have dialogues. They want us to encourage people from the Middle East to come to that center and not say, not have them tell us what we need, but let us tell them what we need. We tell them. Because, and that, that's something amazing, because a lot of communities, a lot of people who are in a certain field will say, all right, I'm gonna fix this for you. And they're not like that. They're saying, no, 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 this is a mess, and we wanna help with this mess, but we don't even know where to start. So they're gonna start doing things like having stands in the plaza to where we can start promoting this center. Because even though it's not perfect, and even though the Middle Eastern community should have their own center in the LSE, it's, it's, a, it's a start. It's a start to being recognized, it's a start to being heard and advocated for, but ultimately it's not fair. It's not fair that so many students on this campus are silenced, and so many students feel like they have to sit in that silence. Whether you identify as Middle Eastern or not, ultimately we all want to feel supported and heard. And so we do appreciate what APAC is doing for us, but there is room to grow, and that's why we're having this dialogue today, to say that there needs to be more discussion more discussion out there. Thank you for sharing. So let's get to what brought me to this like carefree Isra who goes up and stands in front of Trump walls and just doesn't care, right? So I'm going to take you all back to 2013. I was a senior in high school, just had a surgery, and I was just getting out of this really cool wheelchair. And I was on my crutches, right? And so I started finally like mobilizing and moving around and stuff. And I was at school, just came back from lunch with one of my really good friends. So what happened? The student comes up to me and he says, hey, why are you wearing that thing on your head? And I said, he clearly didn't care because he was just like walking off with his friend. So I said, it's for my religion. And he said, what's your religion? And I said, I'm a Muslim. 
And he said, Take a selfie with a hijab day. And we brought all these kufis and these gowns and these different garments from the Middle East. And we had people come up to the plaza, come up to our table, and try them on. Not just because I wanted them to try them on and take pictures, but I wanted people to ask questions. And what else is going to get people to talk to you other than like food and trying on like funky looking clothes, right? About 300 people came up to our table that day and took selfies and took pictures. And I kid you not, no exaggeration, when I say about half of those people literally said, you are the first Muslim or Arab that I have ever met in my life. And you know what? I feel like you're really cool. And we actually have so much in common. And in fact, I feel like we have more similarities than people who actually look like me. People who came up to me and said, I've seen people who, who dress like you, who look like you, and they have beautiful scarves in the bathroom, but I'm too afraid to ask them questions or talk to them about it. But this sparked the conversation. But here's the thing. Oh, this is another thing I started doing, but this was after I graduated, was I wanted to also get people excited, right? What gets people excited, like painting or name in a different language? I mean, I'm sure there's other things that get 
get people excited. But I started saying, okay, you want your name in Arabic? You want a quote in Arabic? You're having a newborn? Let's write their name. Let's write a beautiful quote. And started making these paintings so that, I remember, I believe it was Sean, you're in the audience, right? Who reached out to me and said, hey, I want something in my home so that when Arab, Middle Eastern Muslim people walk in, they feel welcome. They feel like they belong here, right? And that's what I tried to do. But the problem is I can't do that by myself. Me and Gabri Gabriella cannot do that by ourselves. We need people. We need support. Just like those examples that I gave you of when the community came together. Don't just come together when tragedy happens. We don't want to be together when tragedy happens. We want to be together in joyous moments. And you being here and you listening to this is the first step in that. And if I can add on to that before we finish this presentation, we are not trying to say that the Middle East deserves more than any of you. I feel like ultimately what we're trying to say is that all of us as individuals generally want the same things. We want to feel safe. We want to feel respected. We want to feel valued and heard and not judged and criticized by our own differences. And as a community, especially this year, with everything that's happened, I can imagine it feels really overwhelming. There's all of these people that are suffering in silence, and there's all of these people that want more and need more help. So maybe what we hope we can do together is pick up these pieces together. Yes, acknowledge the differences, but also acknowledge that human life is the most important. And so we have to do better as a community at looking out for each other and validating each other's feelings and listening to each other's stories because our story is not your story. And that's why we're thankful for this platform, but everyone should feel encouraged to speak up. No one can tell Israel what her identity is. Nobody can tell me what my identity is, and no one can let us feel silenced. And we ask and we advocate for you the same way. So we do appreciate this platform. We thank you for letting us talk today. And we really hope that you've enjoyed this presentation and hopefully can continue the conversation. Thank you.